Hey, welcome back to the Conservation Conversation. Everybody loves dolphins, and but we always think about ocean dolphins. But today we wanted to pay attention to the plight of the river dolphin, and not only just the river dolphin, but today we're gonna talk about pink dolphins. And here we go. It's actually um, a mix of two of my favorite topics, the pink dolphin and fish fraud, and how fish fraud actually fuels extinction. Because there's a lot of uh, connections that we don't tend to make, especially if you're somebody that can buy your food in a market, uh, you're gonna find your food prepackaged, and it's not going to connect to the outside world and the outside world and all of the, all of the, uh, the issues that surround it. So today we're gonna to talk about the pink dolphin. But before we get into it, here's one of my favorite parts of the show, the quote of the day. So today's quote comes from the wonderful Jacques Cousteau, the happiness of the bee and the dolphin is to exist. For man, it is to know that and to wonder at it. <laughs> I think he really says it there. Uh, it's pretty amazing. You know, the, the fact, I mean, of course, we love bees. We just talked about bees the other day. But dolphins are incredible. And pink dolphins don't really get as much attention as they probably should. Now, if you're like me, you saw the cove, and that really changed a lot of people's perspectives on dolphins and their plight to survive. But that only focuses on certain ocean dolphins. And while it's really important that we all pay attention to that, we are missing these pink dolphins. Now, the pink dolphin, the reason that they are so important is that they're endangered. The IUCN labeled them as data deficient but endangered back in 2018, and it's only gotten worse since then. So today I wanted to talk about sort of the driving factors of what's happening to the pink dolphin and ways that we can actually step in, no matter where you are in the world, and make a change. So. Uh, what I wanted to first do is show you, well, I had the good fortune of going down to work with pink dolphins in the Amazon back in 2017. So it's been a few years, and I have to say that the Amazon never leaves your soul, even if you leave the place behind. <laughs> it's an amazing, amazing place. So I just wanted to show you real quick. These are the, the Amazon River and tributaries now you gotta remember that the Amazon River runs from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean. It's incredible. Now, these, this is what we're looking at right now. This is the range where all the pink dolphins live in. So they're in Colombia, they're in Venezuela, they're in Brazil, they're in Bolivia, and they're in Peru. So this is a species that's important to a lot of, a lot of different cultures. Now, this is the distribution of the river dolphins throughout South America. River dolphins do live in Hong Kong and one or two other places in the world. They're almost extinct as well. So, but right here you can see the Amazon basin is the dark gray and a lot of those areas. Now, uh, I was in Peru when I was out there and it's, it's, it's a complicated, crazy story. So let's just start at the beginning. <laughs> uh, for the pink dolphin, let's see, let me show you guys. Now the pink dolphins have some amazing characteristics that no other dolphins have. First of all, this one here, this will show you, these are, they're actually pink. And the pink dolphin is, is sort of a legend in Peru. The pink dolphin, the pink dolphin, it, uh, it has a lot of legacies around it. Now you have to remember that the pink, Peru and these areas were part of what was called the rubber boom, where all of the colonialists came in, they sort of took over a lot of the tribal areas, exploited every piece of, of uh, uh, forest around there for tree, a tree that creates rubber, the rubber tree. And when the boom stopped, Everybody just left and they left everybody there, whether they were indigenous or they moved to the cities or they had been brought there to work as part of the rubber boom. They left everybody there with no resources and no money. And the pink dolphin kind of bear the brunt of that. Uh, there was a, always a story that the pink dolphins would come out. This is so this is why a lot of the locals and the indigenous are not so keen on pink dolphins. Uh, one, they eat their fish, but two, they were actually blamed 
um, the Boto is what they're called down in South America. The Boto are blamed for a lot of the rapes that happened as of course, as a result of the colonial, the colonial people, but they were blamed. And what the, the theory is with a lot of the indigenous is that the pink dolphin would show up and turn into when it left the water or turn into this really good looking guy that would then bring the women and into his trance and rape them. So the Boto took a lot of very bad, I guess you call it publicity from the indigenous tribes. And it was also a way for them to sort of explain a lot of bad behavior that should have been placed elsewhere other than the pink dolphin. Because as we all know, the pink dolphin does not change shapes. It's not a shapeshifter. It's a dolphin and it's an endangered dolphin. Now, the reason I bring up, I bring this up is that a lot of the indigenous tribes do not care very much for the pink dolphin. Some of them fight really hard um, to preserve the, the pink dolphin. So it's kind of a, a mix of the two. The fishermen do not like the pink dolphins because they come in and they will eat their fish, they'll get into their nets. So the pink dolphin has an uphill battle. Uh, now, you know, just to further the whole colonial thing, when I was there, I was in villages where we were the first white people some of the children had seen and even some of the adults had seen. And as we were sitting there, a lot of the children were playing a game and they were calling us Diablo Blanco, which means white devil. So that is in a lot of ways how uh, white people are seen down there because of the terrible history of colonialism throughout that area, uh, as well as missions that went down there and tried to destroy cultures. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a very hard fought area. So the people have a lot of issues down there already with pink dolphins. So. Let's get onto a more positive aspect of pink dolphins. This is the pink dolphin right here. Now the pink dolphin is a very unique shape as you can see, not at all like a regular uh, dolphin that you would think about seeing um, out on the ocean. Now the reason for this is they live in the Amazon river for the most part and the river, it can go from low tide to high tide and that's about a 30 foot difference sometimes. So what happens is in the low season, they need to be able to to eat in special areas, but in the high season, the water floods a lot of the forest. And what happens is they have to feed through the mangroves and they have this amazing biology where their neck is not fused to their spine and they can rotate their heads uh, in almost uh, 180 degrees. So their heads can move like this and it allows those pointed beaks to get into mangroves and pull out food. And when the tide drops, the mangroves disappear and all they're left with is just the lower part of the river. So they're really amazing. They're a completely different breed of dolphin than again, what we think of the Rizzo or the common dolphin, the types that we see when we're on boats and they're, they're going next to us, which is always a thrill for everybody in the world. Uh, even when we were down in um, the Philippines and we were doing some fishing patrols when I was with Earth Race, we, we had a couple of uh, Navy SEALs on board with us to help us with the, the boat boarding security. And as we're going, you know, we would see the dolphins swimming next to the boat and all the guys were like, yeah. <laughs> so it doesn't matter if you're a kid or a Navy SEAL, you're going to love watching dolphins in their nature. And that is what's beautiful. Now, again, these, these poor river dolphins, they did not really get a lot of love because the cove brought all of our attention to the ocean dolphins, but these river dolphins, are going extinct and they deserve and need our help. And as I mentioned before, they are listed as endangered. They estimate approximately maybe 10 to 20,000 of them exist uh, that are left in nature. And the other problem is there are actually three that are in captivity. And this bodes the big question, should endangered animals be kept in captivity? Uh, now, one of them is in Venezuela, and as we know, Venezuela has really fallen apart, and their zoo has been closed for quite a long time. So these dolphins have been starving, and they have not been well taken care of. Then there is the zoo called Quistacoche in Peru, where I personally went, and I'm going to put a link down here in the comments so you guys can click on a video and go check out the way that this pink dolphin lives in the Quistacoche Zoo. When, when I was in the zoo... Um, Again, I was there with, with Earth Race Conservation and we went down to check on the pink dolphin and try to help. And what we found 
uh, during the daytime, they make the pink dolphin do tricks. And at nighttime, they're in water that is barely deep enough for this dolphin to even survive. Uh, when you go into the tank, it only comes up to about maybe here on, on us. So uh, those were after hours activities. <laughs> uh, they don't allow you to do that during the day or when the zoo is open per se. But it's an kept in amazingly terrible conditions. And as a matter of fact, that particular zoo, the Quistacoche Zoo in Iquitos, Peru, was so bad that they started doing news reports on it. They reported that the dolphin that was there, who had been given to the zoo when he was a baby, he's now 10 years old, well, now, now 13 years old, tried to commit suicide several times by killing himself on the concrete enclosure that he was in, because sometimes the water would only be two meters deep, sometimes only one meter deep, and the dolphin suffered from depression. Now, a lot of scientific reports show that dolphins and humans have a lot of the same emotions and a lot of the same ways of thinking between community and other places. So they're very uh, similar to us. So taking an animal out of its natural habitat where river dolphins are extremely cooperative. When a new river dolphin comes in and a new pink dolphin meets up, you know, from another area, they actually bring it in to part of the family and it becomes part of the group. And pink dolphins are amazing because they don't really jump out of the water very often. The ones you see jumping out of the water, I think, are the ones from Hong Kong. But in the Amazon, they just come to the surface and go, and you just hear them breathing real fast and then they go back down to eat. Whereas, as you see on my YouTube channel, there's a, a jumping dolphin. That's a gray river dolphin, different species. But pink dolphins are very low pro. So as you can imagine, it's difficult for them to get a lot of love because a lot of people don't know about them. There was one documentary uh, called A River Below, but I feel like that movie kind of blew it. It, it. it was more about the filmmaker trying to be clever and trying to put social media on blast instead of really dealing with the dangers of the pink dolphin and what it means to lose the pink dolphin. Now, here's where the part of the story gets really twisted. So now you kind of have a background of where this poor creature lives. And bad, as bad as all that sounds, they, be, okay, in the Amazon, everywhere that we went, we found people were cutting down trees, whether it was illegal logging or people creating villages. And villages there consist of one little path. You, you know, you're just driving down the, the river and you just see one little kind of semi-path. And when you go in, you walk up the paths and the villages tend to be one concrete sidewalk and with you know maybe 10 20 houses on them and that's basically a village uh now these villages they the more and more climate changes and if you don't believe in climate change i would i would argue that maybe you haven't traveled the world enough and maybe you haven't seen enough of the damage that it's doing and you're part of the problem now as cl the climate changes people are starting to expand further and further. So what's happening is it's, it's fueling a lot of issues that are creating food insecurity and other expansion problems. So a lot of these cities are already maxed out and people are starting to move out into what I guess we could call the suburbs uh, now. There's indigenous tribes that live fully off the land that I was really fortunate to meet in Peru. Then there's cities like Iquitos and in between, are starting new settlements of people because there's a lot of food insecurity and when they get out there they can try to find more natural resources. Uh, now the reason this is important is that they're trying to build hydroelectric dams throughout the entire Amazon to accommodate all of this population growth. Overpopulation is another problem. So when you mix climate change and overpopulation you end up with a very terrible issue. So right here, there's actually over 600 dams proposed in the Amazon River itself. Now, what that will do is that will end up destroying the natural flow and the ability of these pink dolphins to survive and to travel and to breed and to prosper and to eat. So we're going to have a lot of issues coming out with that. Now, this is the Belamonte Dam. This is in Brazil. And this dam is actually is one of the largest dams in the world. I believe it's the sixth largest hydroelectric dam in the entire world. And this is what they built in Brazil to help start. This was sort of the beginning of it. Now, a lot of the indigenous tribes stood up 
started to protest it. They actually took over the Belamonte Dam for a while. Uh, they were fearless. But the indigenous tribes have a better respect and understanding. Even if they use animals, they protect the animals for future use. They try to think generations ahead. And these guys really are the true warriors. And they went out there and they took over the Belamonte Dam. They were met with force and eventually, uh, unfortunately, were not able to stop the dam. <clears throat> now, that's just one dam. Just imagine 600 are going to disrupt the entire natural flow of nature. So number one problem that they face is are the dams that are proposed for hydroelectric, which has to do with climate change and overpopulation, which unfortunately those two sort of feed each other uh, in a very, very bad way. Now, the second problem that they face is fish fraud. Now, this is going to be the cycle. We're going to talk about it really quick. What happens is the pink dolphins have a very oily inside. So the, the fishermen will tend to slaughter the pink dolphins, cut them up into little bits, and then they use them, you know, they, they hold them in their hands and they create these elaborate sort of wooden enclosures. And then they go around with the, with the pink dolphin meat and a fish called a piracatinga come over and they eat this dolphin meat. Now the piracatinga is a, um, what do you call it? Uh, uh, oh my gosh. The piracatinga is a bottom feeder. It's a catfish. But a piracatinga is also a carnivorous catfish. So people in Brazil never touch piracatinga because the idea of eating something that eats sometimes human flesh, it's been found to have human parts in it, it'll literally eat anything. So the piracatinga is a fish that Brazilians don't eat just because they know about it. But what they didn't know and what a lot of people didn't know all around Brazil and Peru and other areas is there was a fish called Dordina that started appearing in 2008. And Dr. Silva, uh, who's an amazing um, researcher and somebody, one of the few people that's really out there fighting to save the pink dolphins, did a study by testing the DNA of Dordina in various shops. And as you can see, this is a list of some of the fish that they found. Now, why are people eating piracatinga and changing the name of it? You may ask yourself. Fish fraud. Why fish fraud? Okay, let's go back to the map real fast because I just want to explain this. Um, let's see, where are my maps? So let's go back to the maps and let's just take a look at this real fast. Now, you can see that the Amazon uh, over on the right hand side, it comes in from Atlanta, the Atlantic Ocean, and it comes through and eventually it gets to Peru and Colombia. Now, Colombia loves catfish. In, in Colombia, catfish is one of the main staples of food there and places like Medellin and Colombia uh, and all the areas surrounding it love a fish called capaz. Now, capaz is a catfish, but it was overfished and their fisheries actually collapsed. So they have to import fish. And what they've done is very often imported piracatinga and then relabeled it capaz and gave it out in the stores. And people were eating this catfish, not knowing that it e eats human flesh <laughs> or other dead animals. They think it's just a normal catfish, not a carnivorous catfish. So, the other issue is that the boats come in and they bring in the illegal fish. They also bring in a lot of illegal arms. They smuggle people and they're generally run by cartels. Uh, some of them are run by FARC, some are run by other cartels. And what happens is it becomes a sort of black market thing. So suddenly these fishermen that aren't making any money in Peru and the, the pink dolphins are eating their fish and they're having a hard time surviving can now sell this piracatinga that's a throwaway, nothing, nobody eats this fish to the cartels and the cartels will buy them. What happens is they then go to a processing plant and get stripped out and become fillets of meat. And once that happens, very much like illegal logging, once it goes into the processing plant and gets sent out, nobody can identify it anymore. It's lost all of its markings that would show what it is. Same with illegal logging. They take the illegal trees, once they're processed, they're just planks of wood. Who can track that? So. Illegal, illegal fishing and fish fraud have created death and destruction for the pink dolphin. 
And I don't want to blame the fishermen here. I want to blame the market because the market is allowing for this to exist because so many people eat fish and find it essential to their survival, which, you know, I mean, going back hundreds of years, thousands of years, that was very true. Um, places I went and villages I saw, people do rely on fishing, but they do not take and kill an endangered animal in order to get a fish to eat. They just simply go fishing. So we're talking about mass scale fishing that is actually benefiting a lot of these smaller fishermen. So there's been a couple issues with that. And then what they do not are not able to sell, this is an example of what we saw on the Amazon. This is two small boats and you can see the fire on there. And what's happening is these guys are actually drying out the, uh, they're drying out, um, uh, dead dolphin, dead pink dolphin. And what they're doing is they're creating beef jerky to go sell in the markets because a lot of people don't know that uh, sometimes the beef jerky gets replaced and is sold. Instead, they're using pink dolphin. And if you look carefully, you'll see there's the guy standing up and three guys down is a little longboard motor. And to the right of that longboard motor is a dolphin head. They've taken... And what they do, because it's illegal, uh, they're actually protected. This is the other crazy part of this. It's a protected animal. So what they do is they stay off land, they put two of their boats together, and they create a fire on one of them and try to make beef jerky that they can sell with whatever they were unable to sell or use as bait in, uh, in the process. So I wanted to show you guys, this is a photo of some of the uh, dolphin rolls that we found inside of a market in Requena, Peru. And this is supposed to just be fish. But again, by the time you smoke it and roll it up, like those guys were just doing on the boat, nobody can tell what it is. If, if you're a marine biologist, you'll know that the muscle patterns are different between fish and dolphin. Uh, and that is one clue that some people can use. But believe me, nobody is thinking about that. They're just seeing jerky, they're hungry, they're poor, and they want some food. So the pink dolphin is being decimated by dams. It's being decimated by illegal fishing and fish fraud, where Piracatinga is appearing as Dordina and Capaz in Colombia. And Dordina is a fake fish, by the way. It doesn't exist. Uh, it's not a real fish. They just made up the name so they could sell the Piracatinga meat as something else. And a lot of Brazilians ate it unknowingly. Again, they would never eat Piracatinga due to its carnivorous uh, and eating human flesh. And it has been, they've found dead bodies in the Amazon where the Piracatinga were like, yes, all over it. So it's not a fish Brazilians would even touch. So what can we do? What are the solutions, right? Um, one thing that I wanted to, to really bring up with everybody too is, uh, and again, here, this is a Piracatinga. Now, there was a ban on the Piracatinga from 2015 that was imposed by Brazil in order to stop all the fish fraud. And it helped decline the amount of river dolphins that were being killed, which is fantastic. Um, yeah, so this is a species of catfish attracted to rotting carcasses. Now, the moratorium on Piracatinga fishing in Brazil lapsed in January 2020 due to Bolsonaro. Uh, and Bolsonaro has um, unfortunately been very destructive to, to the environment, but this is one of the ways. So the Piracatinga fishing is back open. Now, I'm sorry for this image. This is a dead pink dolphin, but two dead dolphins yield about $2,400 in catfish sales in a single day of fishing. Now, you have to remember that most of these fishermen will make approximately five to ten dollars a day so this is their incentive and having the background where the boto the pink dolphin is already maligned by many cultures and many fishermen it's not a big stretch for them to do that uh, this is actually a haul of pink dolphins that the authorities found in brazil on a fisherman's boat and it was like those little teeny fish fishermen you know fishing boats that we saw now these particular ones are not as pink, but you can tell from the long snout that it is a pink 
dolphin, river dolphin. So that's a massive issue. Now, what are the solutions? Well, in 2010, a, a lot of scientists came together and they created the action plan for South American river dolphins. And these were scientists from Bolivia, Venezuela, Colombia, Peru, and Brazil, the five countries that the Amazon River spans through and that the pink dolphins live in until, unfortunately, they're going to remove these, this option for them to have their normal life by adding in 600 dams. So one, there's one group I can really, really, really um, say donate to. If you want to help the pink dolphins, you know, there, there are groups that will take you on pink dolphin tours. There's, there's places in Brazil where you can go swim with the pink dolphins. Please do not do that. That is a major problem. They're starting to use pink dolphins to help uh, as therapy for children. It's another terrible use of the pink dolphins. The pink dolphins need to be left alone and we need to stop seeing them slaughtered for piracatinga meat and bait. We need to stop these dams from destroying the natural flow and the natural fish populations that these animals need to stay alive. And we need to be a lot more cautious about fish fraud. I don't eat fish, but for my friends that do eat fish, please be very cautious what you're eating. Fish fraud is rampant in the U.S. internationally. By the way, Piracatinga has been sent and been found in U.S and renamed and relabeled other types of fish. So you may have already eaten rotting corpse catfish without knowing it. So Fernando Trujillo uh, runs Omacha and you can go to omacha.org and they actually do a lot of work. If you saw a river below, you'll be familiar with Dr. Trujillo's work. Um, I believe he's based in Colombia, but he definitely does not spend too much time there. He's always out on the river. He, he, he personally goes through a lot of death threats from the syndicates and the cartels, the governments, and a lot of other places to fight and stand up and give a voice to the river dolphin, to the pink river dolphin, which again is an endangered animal and they have seen the species decline, uh, unfortunately, every year. So solutions are hard fought, hard found, and hard won battles. But we'd like to see more of these fishing bans go into place against Piracatinga because Brazil is one of the major, um, one of the major violators of this particular fish fraud. And with so much money on the line, people tend to look the other direction. It's a terrible, terrible thing. We need to get those poor pink dolphins out of those zoos. The three that are left, they're all kept in terrible conditions. And I can't believe there's one in Germany, one in Venezuela, and one in Peru. Mind you, Iquitos, the Amazon River borders Iquitos. So this poor dolphin has spent 10 years, approximately one kilometer from the river where he was born. How did he get there? There is a law in Peru that if a fisherman captures a pink dolphin, they're supposed to turn it into a sanctuary and that sanctuary then brought it to the zoo. The sanctuary is down there, by the way. It's a very tricky thing. We'll get into another show of it, but they very, very often will, uh, tribes and other people will come in and pay these um, sanctuaries or, you know, I don't know how they term them down there. Uh, and there's a very unfortunate one. It's actually sponsored by the Dallas Zoo and they take in a lot of manatees which are also in danger, uh, getting in danger down there. But manatees and pink dolphins become massive food sources. So what happens is these sanctuaries take them from the fishermen, sell them for a couple thousand dollars. And I know because we were able to get them to offer to sell out to us. What they do is they say, okay, we're gonna go release this animal back into the wild. And everybody applauds and go, oh, this is a great sanctuary. But what they do is these, these tribes will pay them and then they will tell them where they're releasing them, and then they kill them right away. Uh, manatees are killed for food everywhere through the Amazon, um, and the pink dolphins are killed, not to eat unless it's jerky, but killed for bait to go fishing for piracatinga and other forms of catfish in order to sell it on the black market. So it is a massive, massive issue. It's still an issue that has not received enough attention, 
And one of the best resources, omacha.org, O-M-A-C-H-A.org. If you look down below while we're doing this, or while we're playing this video, I'm going to put in the comments a link to two different videos that I shot in the Amazon with Earth Race Conservation, one of them inside of the Quistacoche Zoo. And you can see the types of conditions that this animal lives in. And it's just, it's, it's heartbreaking. And the second one is actually the video of those guys smoking that pink dolphin as they came by us, uh, where we saw the pink dolphin head on that particular boat. So pink dolphins, uh, there's a clothing line called pink dolphin. They do not donate any money to pink dolphins. Please do not buy that thinking that you are supporting pink dolphins. You're not. Um, check out omacha.org. Uh, Dr. Trujillo works very hard to save the pink dolphins. Any donations are appreciated there. Um, and I guarantee you that they are in the field working. Uh, you can also contact me uh, for other organizations that I can help direct you to that you can either volunteer or donate money to down in Iquitos and Peru that are wonderful, wonderful solutions. So uh, I hope everybody's enjoyed today talking about the pink dolphins. I would love to know your thoughts on if you've heard of pink dolphins, other issues the pink dolphins may face, or any questions you have about the pink dolphin. And I would love to get into a big dialogue down here. So please leave comments below. Uh, if you like this video or you liked learning about the pink dolphin, I'm also going to uh, link down below a previous podcast we've done on fish fraud that can help you see how the pink dolphin fits into a worldwide fish fraud issue. And fish fraud is fueling extinction. It is destroying so many types of species. And it's one of the biggest problems just because humans uh, feel that it is their right to eat fish and all the fisheries are collapsing. And now there's a question mark on what to do. So check out the previous podcast, please. If you like this, please like, share it, add a comment. Uh, any type of interaction will help the YouTube videos do well. Anyway, I was really uh, appreciate everybody taking the time to come in, sit down and talk about some pink dolphins. And as uh, I look forward to seeing everybody next week, next week we're going to have um, the Seldif.org community organizer, Tish Odell, back on the show with us. Is that next week? Yes, it is next week. So I'll see everybody next Saturday. And remember, it's our world. Let's talk about it.